Monday, January 17th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And, and this, this is Geek, Geek Nights. Nights. Jinx. Personal. Uh, uh, <laughs> tonight, we take dibs on shotgun. Let's do this. So last night, I had to engage in one of those semi-annual tasks that is uh, not so much something I want to do, but something that must be done. You know, how, Insert innuendo here. You know how a man has a duty, and every now and then you have to uh, stand up and do your duty to the world. And last night, I, being the designated Drano doer, had to buy that scary-ass shit and pour it down the drain while Scott watched from afar. It was kind of interesting because it was like, it used to be liquid, but now it's gel. Which... Well, no, no, no. There, you can still get the liquid. There's three kinds. There's the normal liquid. Three. One, two, two three, three kinds. kinds. Three kinds. <laughs> There's the normal liquid, which is like standard Drano. And by Drano, I mean generically everything. Take it's that trademark. Acid in a, in a jug. No, it's the opposite of acid. The base in a jug. Yes. <laughs> Alkaline. Ooh. So there's the liquid one, which is like the, the standard weak sauce. Mm -hmm. And then there's the gel, which is... Well, weak sauce, still, if you touch it, it'll horribly yes. burn you. But then, then there's the gel, which is, all right, I'm going down there and I'm cleaning that out. Yeah, the gel, I, I realized... It's probably just as powerful, but because it goes down slowly, it actually sits there for longer, burning more. And then there's the foamer, the one I use usually, which is two dangerous chemicals that when you mix them together in the drain, it goes foam, 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 foam. I actually feel safer with that one because if you only one of them spills, it's a little, it's a, I guess, it's more okay. You know what? I think you would have to put forth quite a bit of effort to only spill one of them. <laughs> yeah, I know. Plus, it's scary because if the drain's really clogged and you put it down there, it the foam just, just comes right back up. Yep. And now I'm standing there and there's, there's evil just sitting there all over it. I'm like, what do I do now? It's very strange that I'm so afraid of that stuff, right? But, like, in school, in the chemistry lab, I just be like, yeah, boiling hydrochloric acid, sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was Krenzel in my high school who we were told in the chemistry lab we had some concentrated hydrochloric acid in a thing, in a fume hood. We're doing something with it. And he's like, now, everyone, uh, make sure you don't get your head in the fume hood because hydrochloric acid will make you pass out pretty much immediately if you inhale it. And Craig goes, really? And then he passes out. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so... Uh, Emily and Scott are and pretty much most sane human beings don't like to be around Drano and it is kind of a scary thing and for whatever but that reason tub, it was backed up it for whatever help. reason it is my duty I'm the one who has to do this every time it happens I would probably do it if you weren't here and it needs oh, to be yeah, done but I was here and <laughs> it could have been I'm done I'm not going to do it if I, I'm not going to do it if I don't have to it needed to be done for like a week and a half I, but, I, uh, basically that morning yesterday morning I took a foot bath <laughs> when I was taking a shower yeah I an don't unwanted like, foot bath I don't like a having nasty soapy soap be dirty water shouldn't be that dirty. but this morning i had to like spray my water feet spray my feet with water because they were so dry because the drain <laughs> was flowing so nicely yeah drano is some scary stuff but uh it's my duty as a man and i will continue to do it until the day i die hopefully not from drano <laughs> thing uh, is i never keep drano in the house i always buy it and then use it right away and then it's gone yeah that's definitely the, the way I, to go i always i remember as a kid too because i remember i think the only reason i'm not so afraid of is that as a kid my mom always made me do it so i kind of <laughs> built up a uh, mental immunity but even then, I always was afraid, like, what if I'm doing dishes and I just grab the Drano by mistake and pour it in the sink? <gasps> Luckily, you can't, because those Drano bottles are also scary looking. Yeah, well, kids, here's, here's a lesson that you everyone should know. Drano's scary. Like, don't use it in the toilet. You know, it says, don't use it in the toilet, and they're not kidding. Yeah. They're not I mean, kidding. I, you know, I'm, I was so afraid of it that I was never in a position to make that mistake, but I, I could have made that mistake quite easily. It's kind of like uh, mixing ammonia and bleach. Don't do it. Don't even bother asking why. Just don't do it. You might die. A lot of old ladies die of that, or at least used to. Yeah, don't do that. Well, they all, they all died already. Okay. <laughs> all right. Do you have a news over there? I kind of do. Kind of? So, uh, I could have talked about this on Monday, but I'm going to go from the more human side instead of the technology side, even though the technology here is really cool. And I think we're going to see a lot of this cyborgization and uh, such in the future. Great. In our lifetime. Mm -hmm. But uh, the gist of the story is that there is a man, Oscar Pistorius, a world-class sprinter. Mm. And he wanted to compete in the Olympics. Mm. There's one problem. He has no legs. Unlike Coconut Monkey, he at least has arms, but he has no legs. Well, did he ever have legs? I assume so. He, was he a world-class sprinter when he had the legs? I don't know. He's a double amputee. I didn't right. read the whole story. The deal is, though, he has artificial legs. So they decided, all right, well, maybe we'll let you compete in the Olympics. 
And then they decided after doing some testing that no, because you're using artificial legs, you are not allowed to compete in the Olympics. Now, the reason why, the specific reason was not that it's dangerous or that it's unfair because he'd lose or it's because his artificial legs are so much better than real legs for running. He is faster and better than any human could ever be with these artificial legs. Well, what it was is that they measured, you know, in, in many trials that he could expend less energy to go just as fast as normal people, you know, or other sprinters, you know, so he could actually run as fast as the other people, but you, it would be easier for him to do it than it would be them for them to do it at the same speed. Now, I recommend you check out this article just to see a picture of the artificial legs. They're really cool. Yeah, they're pretty cool. And uh, I don't know. I have a lot to say about this. I mean, on one hand, I always knew this day would come, and I'm, I'm sure it will be coming more and more in the future because we saw this even not in earlier times where uh, pitchers in baseball, there's a common injury you can get if you're a pitcher in baseball, mm. and there's a surgery that fixes it. I forget all the details, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I, pretty much the deal is if you get this injury, you can like pull this tendon back and then sew it down somewhere, and it fixes it. But as a result, it also makes you a lot stronger for pitching. So there were debates about, is it okay if a pitcher just gets that surgery and they're perfectly fine? Or what if they pitch badly to try and get the injury just so they can get the surgery? Yeah. And uh, we're getting to the point now where there are prosthetics and uh, replacement parts for human bodies that are arguably better well, then, better for some uses. I'm sure his legs are not. Oh, I am those sure. legs are made for running. I'm sure he has different legs. These shoes for, are made for walking. Yeah, I'm sure he has different legs for walking around. And you know, his life is not as easy oh, as, no, as no, your no. life. See, that's the thing. I am sure that he would much rather have um, mm. legs. <laughs> I'm also, but you know, that you can make. You know, we don't. We're not at the point yet where we can make a, a body part that is superior in all ways to the body parts we currently have. But at the same but time, but that's because the world we've made is a world that is designed for you know human parts if we could redesign the whole world to make it more convenient for like you know wheelchairs then all of a sudden people without wheelchairs would actually have a hard time well i think it's also just the fact that the technology is not there yet to make something that is overall completely 100 percent better i That's, mean that, yeah. the thing is though that is going to happen in our lifetimes maybe I, I, probably I, there's very little doubt in my mind that we're going to see a point in our lives where there will be maybe an artificial eye or an artificial ear, or an artificial hand that is better in every possible way than what a human being naturally could achieve. And at that point, uh, I don't know, I find that really interesting. I mean, yeah. on one hand, uh, definitely this is great for people who are injured, but there are going to be people who will want to upgrade. Not Kind of like with vision. You can do this with glasses now. You can get glasses if you have bad vision. They give you 20-20 vision. You can also, if you want get glasses that give you 2010 vision. I, in fact, did that. I get My glasses now actually give me better than normal vision. I paid extra for that. It's an option you can do. There are people with perfectly good vision who buy fancy designer glasses that let them see better. Yep. Well, no, what, night vision goggles. Hello. Yeah. But uh, I think, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people are going to be very resistant to the idea of someone cutting off their hand and getting a better devil hand. Like Luke Skywalker? <laughs> or uh, <laughs> Fry. Yeah. I think the real issue here, as it relates to sports, right, is that... See, that's the other half of this conversation. Yeah, is that a sport is a game. It's a competition, right? And, the you know, the steroids falls into this, too, is that they sort of haven't answered the fundamental question, which is, we have a competition, you're testing something. You're testing, you know, especially a versus competition like sprinting, right? And the question is, that they haven't answered, is, what are you testing, Right. Are, and, you know, if you're testing, you know, the ability of, you know, a unmodified human body to propel itself with its legs and you're, you want it, you, and faster is better well, like, than someone who doesn't have an unmodified human body can't really enter that competition. But if the competition is, you know, uh, any human body, how fast can you make it move by any means possible? Then rockets. Uh, rockets and whatnot is the way. But I mean, like, look at F1. People think like people think car racing is just car racing. But look at the difference between like Le Mans or uh, F1 or kart racing. And like F1, for example, you think, oh, it's testing driver skill. 
Well, driver skill is one part of it, but the other part of it is they're testing car technology within a certain set of constraints. Yep. If they wanted to test just driver skill, and they're, and they're, they would give everyone the exact same car. Yep. Not only that, but they're testing car technology and driver skill for driving incredibly fast on a complicated route uh, repeatedly over uh, like an hour or so of time. As opposed to like... Le Mans, which, which is an endurance race. They're testing not how... Also, how, they're testing how fast, but also how long can you drive. Or NASCAR, which is testing largely driver strategy and that sort of thing. Yep. There, there's... And, and in sports, I don't know. I feel like there are two directions to go with sports in the future. And the thing is, it's easy to make delineations now because, all right... You can tell if someone has become a cyborg or not. It's obvious that someone has a cyborg body yeah. part. What are we going to do when these things are organic? What are we going to do when you can just cut off your leg and replace it with a vat grown leg that is just better? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't have a problem with if, if, you know, sports go this way or sports go that way. It really doesn't matter to me. But if in any game, you really have to define the rules and... You know, what if you whatever the rules are defined as, that's what it is. And if it turns out that people like a sport better with different rules, then the rules will change. Well, you know what I think? I think in the long run, what's going to happen is that the sports in terms of athleticism, I think, are eventually going to disappear. Uh, and I think that what will happen is because if human bodies and the way we interact with the world become so mutable, then games will no longer be games of physical prowess on such a direct low level because that's not interesting anymore. You want someone to run faster? You make a running guy. You want someone to throw a javelin? You make a guy with one really, really, really big arm but and maybe, one really, really, really little Maybe arm. as in F1, where there's the mechanical component of who can make the fastest car, it'll become who can make the fastest running guy. Well, that's guy. what I'm saying. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see competitions that are purely technical or purely, you know, looking at the aspect of what can we do within the constraints of the physical world and kind of like f1 where all right here are the constraints of this competition you can build a cyborg as long as you don't break any of these rules go nuts mm -hmm. and i think in terms of sports we will i think all sports are eventually going to become games entirely of skill and strategy and not at all of athleticism yeah uh, i think perhaps. that is the because i mean look at how many sports we've talked about this before but like baseball the strategy of baseball has become so perfected that the, the who wins and loses comes down to such minute factors as in this guy is one percent stronger because he trained one percent more and as a result he hits one percent more home runs or the and, wind yes <laughs> and at that point i feel like games with more uh strategy and at like skill and talent involved like Hockey, though hockey eventually will have this problem too. All games Hockey, will. I think, will have the problem last. Well, no, football will also last a very long time. Yes, because football is not completely exhausted. And also, they change the rules of football. Yeah, you they can, change them all the time. You can, Every time football turns... The well, referees don't even know the rules of football. Yeah. I could link you to some football rules. Uh, we're not talking about soccer, sorry. Europeans and other people. Not, We're know, talking see. about a real sport. Ta not yeah, really. I actually, I, I, I could send you some rules from the NFL official rule book that you could not understand what they are. Dude, I've been to football games where half the time something weird happens and the whole Audi crowd is like, what's going on? I mean, and football is the only sport where the ref will come out and everyone gets quiet and the ref says, the rule was blah. Blah happened. Therefore, blah. That yep. doesn't happen in hockey. In hockey, something happens, and then the refs go mumble, 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 and then the game just continues, and someone's sitting in a box. I know most of those crazy football rules, but not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, yeah. That's part of what makes football entertaining, though, is when crazy stuff happens like that. You know, I, I, I've noticed that in any sport, whenever something crazy happens, it always seems like that makes it a lot more fun like hockey yep. whenever a crazy fight breaks out that game is 10 times more memorable oh yeah all right so my news here right what do you got they did this scientific study oh science uh, involving neurologies you like those neurologies i like fusiform gyri all right here's Gyruses. what they did here's what they did here they took some wine you like wine right uh i do in fact like wine I could go on. I could do a show about wine, but I don't think you want to. They had a whole bunch of the wine, and the wine was all the same. I don't wine. want to talk about this story about wine. I'm gonna make a lame joke about whining instead. Anyway. Anyway. It, they had a whole bunch of wine. It was all the same wine, and they put it in bottles. And some of the bottles were ten dollar wine, and some were ninety dollar wine. But it was oh, all the same wine. It was I just, see what they did there. Just different bottles, right? It's kind of like uh, on Penn and Teller's bullshit when they had the hose water. Yep, exactly. But this is a study, and not just so uh, it was hose an wine. anecdote. Hose wine. Yeah, so they had hose. They had 
all this normal wine, and I don't know if it was good or bad or what. I, I imagine they must have redone the study with different wines because they, they're the professionals, not me, right? And they had some of it was, you know, some of it people drank thinking it was cheap, and some of it people drank thinking it was fancy, right? And what they did is they... Um, they like scan people's brains like for pleasure or something like that. I don't know the details of that, but I guess it was a percent signal charge in the MOFC is what they were looking at. The mosque. Yeah. It's my favorite part of the brain other than the fusiform gyrus. Yep. And they have a little graph here and there's a whole article that you can read. And the little graph, I don't know, I like the hippocampus too. All right, the little graph has a has the x the y axis is the percent signal change in the MOFC and the x axis is time, right? And there's a little arrow and the arrow points to zero <laughs> on the time track. You know, I'm just picturing a, a completely made up graph that doesn't say anything. It no, it does. Arrows. It does. It says something. But but the point the graph here, I'll read the 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 zero the Oh God! The zero on the graph. What, what's the, what, what did the study find? Basically, that you, if you think the if the wine is more expensive, even before you drink it, your pleasure will start going up, and then after you drink it, it will go up even more. And if now, you think did that, it, did that correlate with self assessment of enjoyment and self assessment of the wine itself, or was it just noted in the brain? The the graph here is. Uh, with br- with brain action. So just the brain, because I'm curious, because I I can think of one explanation that isn't just. Oh no! Right? Here's the second graph, which is the uh, the ranking, which which people said was better. Do they coincide? Uh, pretty much. Yeah, people said the more expensive ones were better. Well, it's like that Dilbert. The more expensive shoes are clearly superior. The chart shows that people rank taste of a forty five dollar wine higher than the same wine priced at five dollars, and the same for a different wine marked at ninety and ten. So I guess they had two wines. One of them was $45 and five, and the other one was 90 and 10. The, uh, the original graph that I sucked at explaining says, the, su- the text on that says, this graph shows the activity in the brain's pleasure center. There's more activity with wine subjects think cost $90 a bottle than the same wine priced at $10. Well, I remember two similar studies. One where they took McDonald's wrappers and McDonald's logos and put them on food or didn't put them on food. And children ranked McDonald's branded food that was identical, much, much higher in terms of taste and quality. Mm -hmm. And there was that beer study where they took a bunch of beer drinkers and they they did a a double blind beer test. And they found that most people couldn't tell at all and in fact often preferred beer that they had added vinegar to as part of the test. Uh, Yeah. But basically I think this, this, this is from, let's see, Caltech, Stanford, great. Yeah, so Smart Places is from. I've suspected for a long time, and there's been evidence, but now I think there's a preponderance of evidence that suggests that the amount that people say they like something or, you know, uh, do in in fact like something, the amount of pleasure people get from something is not entirely just based on the qualities, uh, the inherent qualities of that something they are enjoying. I think part of it is just that the human brain is complex and all these sorts of factors, even subconsciously, can affect the way you perceive the world. I mean, look at the placebo effect. You can, if you believe that something will alleviate pain, oftentimes you will feel as though you experience less pain, even though nothing has changed. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, I do think, though, that, uh, you know, the professional wine tasty people, the real professional wine tasty people, not the people pretending, but, you know, they drink wines that are all just labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They don't know which ones are which or how much they cost. So that's that's still a fair test there. But, you know, next time, you know, you see someone driving a BMW talking about how great it is. Well, maybe if uh, it was the same exact car, but it said like POS on it, they wouldn't like it as much. <laughs> but by the same token, mm-hmm. if I was driving a uh a Horizon, let's say. A Plymouth Horizon? But it had a uh, Ferrari logo on it, and I paid $100,000 for it. I'm probably not going to have a good time. <laughs> no, probably not. You know, it, I think what really rings true in the end is just eat what tastes good to you and drink what tastes good to you. And if you like the $5 wine, buy the $5 wine. If you want to impress your friends, say it was a $40 wine. They don't know. I think the, the real goal here is to just the... To avoid marketing and avoid, you know, sort of like, you know, getting preconceived notions of, of what if things are going to be good or bad before. Or at the same time, get, get preconceived notions that things are expensive and good 
And then things will taste better to you if your brain is messing with you. Yeah, I mean, it just just have really high expectations of really cheap stuff, and sudden, maybe that's how Scott Johnson watches all those movies. <laughs> no, I think it's purely the uh, dollar-to-unit fun ratio there, because, sure, it may be a crappy anime, but he only paid a dollar for it. <laughs> I know, right? Plus, uh, that's also the man who showed us Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, is that, uh, yeah... Expectations have a great effect on actual perceived pleasure in the end. Anyway, things of the day. So what do you got for me, Scott, on this here uh, Thursday thing of the day? Well, there's a, you know, if, if a cartoon was made in 1938, that cartoon is in the public domain. Uh, yes, it is. Yep. So here is a cartoon. I think it is a Merry Melody, if, I, if I'm... Oh, correct. man. It's on YouTube. Uh, I don't know how long it'll stay on YouTube, because, you know, while it is a uh, public domain, that, you know, YouTube, and someone might complain, and then, you know, without even asking questions, they take it off, whatever. But it is, uh, this is, like, the highest quality YouTube video I've ever seen, and it's a, uh, it's called Catnip College. You can't go wrong watching a Merry Melody. I haven't watched it yet, and, uh... I don't think I've ever seen it, but it doesn't freaking matter. Right, is it uh, better or worse than I like to sing it in the moon? And I don't think it's that as good as that I one. I like to sing it. That's the best one. The so blue and T four two. Nothing beats that one, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this one it can't be bad. It's a merry melody. I don't know. I'm highly partial to the old uh, Bugs Bunny versus that opera singer. Even though as a kid I loved it, and then as an adult I saw it again. All I could think was, "Wow, Bugs Bunny's an asshole." Yeah, he is. That's why <laughs> that guy so didn't great. deserve that. <laughs> That's why he's so great. <laughs> <laughs> and Daffy Duck needed to be committed. God damn. Yeah, he did. <laughs> All right, well, what was your favorite? Uh, we could do the show on Looney Tunes instead. We could just cut it right now. Nah, we'll save that one because I'd have to watch a bunch again. That's true. And but... also, it's tough because I like a lot of Looney Tunes, but All at right. the same time, the uh, old uh, Donald Duck versus Chip and Dale okay. is some of my favorite you cartoons have to pick ever. A single war- old Warner Brothers cartoon, a single one, not not a character, but like a single one. Which one do you pick? Apple Core, Baltimore. That's, isn't that, Who's your friend? Isn't that Disney? Yeah, it is, but it's so funny. No, it, it can't be Disney. Ah, pick a Looney Tune or Melly Melody or something like that. All right. I could pick one of those really old racist ones. <laughs> uh, it's funny how they remade a lot of those not quite so racist. Yeah, they did. I'm, I'm kind of glad they did that. Yeah, it's good. Anyway. No, you didn't pick one. Oh, right now? Yeah. I don't know. You suck. The opera singer. All right. I'm picking uh, it's hiding in the stove, eh? Uh, I think the uh, best <laughs> line in that one, because there was a similar, there's been a lot of pair of... Uh, homages to that that's but, my favorite one but just the line a lot. when he comes into the room and the other guy's locked up and he says i know you's done it i don't know how you's done it but i know you's done I think, it i think that's the other mugsy uh, cartoon that's not the same one it doesn't matter because that line that one though is is all up there it's way up there that line is just one of the funniest things yeah it is shut so, up uh, <laughs> shut up shut up shut <laughs> up <Right>. so <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yeah. <for> the day. <laughs> All right, so um, I you know I went skiing last weekend and uh, my neck is not broken. I've determined it. Damn. I've, I think most of my pain is gone, so I don't think I permanently injured myself. But uh, I remembered skiing. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, it's really not easy for all my friends who don't ski. Like, it's kind of hard to show like what it's like to be skiing. And I was just thinking about that. Like, man, I'm sure someone is skied with a camera on their head. Oh yeah, and I'm point. gonna find something, but. I stumbled upon this on College Humor, and I figured this is also interesting because in the summer, you know, when I can't ski, because I plan to ski a lot from now on, but I used to mountain bike a lot, and I haven't mountain biked much in the last, I don't know, three years. Cause I it, are you time. sure that's the right verbiage? Shouldn't it be mountain bicking? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been. <laughs> anyway, so... I also remember as a kid, whenever I'd go biking, because my mom, like, I'd come home cut up and, and like, I had bruises and I'd come over like, a broken helmet or, my, like, my bike would be just completely destroyed. And my mom would always be like, what the hell were you doing? And I always thought, like, man, I should just bring a camera and show her and then maybe she'd understand, like, what it is that I do here. But uh, I saw this and I thought of that and here you go. If you ever wondered what it's like to go mountain biking, now I'm not talking, like, downhill mountain biking. I'm talking single track with, I guess, intermediate to, like, the lower end of the advanced tricks. I'll admit, there are like five things in this video that there's no way in hell I could have done. But uh, if you ever wondered what it's like to go single track mountain biking like that, check this out. It's uh, 
It's super fun, and I highly recommend you do it. If you like getting hurt. You won't get hurt. Actually, yes, you will. <laughs> Often. <laughs> when it comes, I'll tell you what, here's the secret. If you, Skiing and mountain biking have one thing in common, one very important thing. If you see someone who is good at skiing or mountain biking, they're only that way because they have hurt themselves several times to get that good. Yep. Right. All right, so. So. Uh, it. Uh, shoddy. Uh, dibs? No. I win. No. <laughs> All right, so you got to talk about all these silly games that people play? Doorknob. <laughs> yeah. I think we should because uh, we thought these games are kind of this cultural heritage. I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, in Europe. I'm sure there's similar games, but in the United States here, there is a long and hallowed tradition of adolescent males and to a lesser extent females. They have different games, some of them, because... I don't know many they have girls. They're clapping games with the with the rhymes that I can't play. <laughs> I don't know how those work. But I have not known many girls who played doorknob as children. No, not really. But yet it's weird how as a kid, I never remember anyone teaching me how to play doorknob. I never remember like thinking, "Oh, the game doorknob." It was just like as far as I can tell, as long as I was sentient, if a kid farted, and I said doorknob, I had the unmitigated human right to wail on them. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, it's so strange how there, there are these games, and I remember that I, didn't, I wasn't playing the game forever. There was a point at which the game sort of came into daily protocol, but it's, it's a game you're always playing, at least among your you know, close friend family company, you know? And the, the game is always on, you know, but it, it's not like it's not always on like you're always thinking about it. It's just so, during certain events during the day can bring the game into into play, you know, and it, it's you never stop playing it. There's no winner or loser or anything. There might be a winner or loser of the moment, but there's yep. no there's no end of the game. It's just this sort of social rule you put into your life that doesn't really mean anything, but you just put it there and it just for no reason whatsoever but somehow that rule and that protocol spreads like a meme among everybody and everyone's playing it. Even people you've never met before are playing the same game. And Perhaps remember, slightly different rules. These games spread long before there was an internet. It's not like the internet allowed this to happen. But yet somehow, kids in the Midwest played pretty much the same games that kids in California played. Yep. Except Pogs. Yep. All right, so, <laughs> so the first game, I think the most widespread game of all is Shotgun. Now, Shotgun is triggered whenever a group of people <laughs> are going to get into a motor vehicle. Now, the thing is, Shotgun, what I, what I find interesting about it is that it, it's one of the few of these games that serves a purpose. It serves a very specific purpose. And I've noticed a lot of people seem to play this game more so when car space or cars are limited. Like... When you're in high school and you have the one friend who's 16 and has a car and you're cramming like eight people in that car, you can cram an infinite number of people in the back seat and it totally sucks. But only one person sitting in the passenger seat. So sitting there is like this holy throne. And, you know, since it, it usually happens when not everyone owns a car. I mean, if everyone owns a car, then it's not really a big deal because you take enough cars to be comfortable and... You know, but when there's only one person who's a driver, that person's like, ah, I will always be comfortable. But everyone else is like, oh, shit, only one of us can be comfortable. Who's it going to be? Yep. So you it must actually, battle. It's like when I was a kid in Michigan, just because of the nature of the area, no one ever played shotgun because pretty much everyone had a car. I mean, you could get a you could buy it for three hundred dollars. You could buy a car that will get you to school. Yep. But you need, we need because, you know, not everyone's going to be comfortable. You need some protocol for determining who gets to be comfortable this time. And. You know, there are many things you could arrange to make it fair, but in the end, everyone just plays shotgun, which is the game of shotgun. Now, I remember that we had basically one car among the entire front, well, maybe one and a half cars among the entire front row crew when we were freshmen. Yeah, freshmen at least. And uh, sophomores, we still we only got had... More, we, yeah, we still sucked, but we had more cars. Barely. We had like two and a half cars. Yeah, then we got more cars within a year or two. Yeah, because we all had money finally. Yeah. And then we lost all that money because we got cars. <laughs> and now we and now we have cars and money. Yeah, I barely no time. Have, I barely have a car. That's true. <laughs> but uh, it's funny how because I remember we were talking about board games a few episodes ago, and I remember I said something about how you can tell the geeks or the board game nerds from normal human beings because. If the geeks sit around and play a game made for three-year-olds called Peanut Butter and Jelly, where you play down cards and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, 
within five minutes, there's going to be an argument as to a possible race condition in the game that is ambiguously defined in the rules. Yep. And the timing considerations of peanut butter and jelly. And I point out that, I don't know, within two days of the front row crew coalescing into a body that had access to 1.5 cars, we ran into the problem of how to deal with shotgun. Because you see, we'd all be going somewhere. We all walk outside. And no, we had never really defined what the rules of shotgun were. Someone would just say it. And eventually, you know, it was such a high demand commodity that we'd all kind of stand outside the door. And then suddenly everyone would yell shotgun simultaneously. And then there'd just be a fight. So then what do you do? Because, you know, being gamers, we all do the best we can to win the game every time. We we're paying attention. We're, it's on our minds. We want to win. Winning is important, not e even mo perhaps more important than the actual comfort you get by winning. And I think that the uh, it came to a head when we were sitting around in the house and someone was like, all right, let's go to the uh, blah. And Shotgun. Then, yep. And then we all said, all right, we got to deal with this. So we came up with a, with a bunch of rules. Like if there was a tie, then whoever touched the passenger side door handle first gets to be shotgun. But if they pull that handle, thus preventing the door from unlocking when it's supposed to unlock, then they lose their shotgun privileges. And uh after someone calls shotgun, someone else can say not bitch to avoid sitting in the <laughs> middle of the back seat. Uh, but Some people would go for the uh, preemptive not bitch because they knew they wouldn't get shotgun, but no one, no one ever goes for second place. No, no. And then, then we, we figured out that you couldn't say shotgun until, like, some conditions where everyone See, is walking we, towards the vehicle we tried and a, the course was set. We tried a bunch of different things. Because originally we were like, all right, everyone has to be outside. So then we'd get into a situation where, like, everyone's going outside and I go to get my keys. And I walk out. And I see everyone standing on the edge of the door with a foot sticking out the door, just waiting. Many times people would step, the last person would, you know, hide in the bathroom or something or go, actually go to the bathroom and step out last and say shotgun <laughs> as they stepped out. Yeah. I mean, every, pretty much people gamed it as much as they could. That's, that's how a game goes. You game it. I think the eventual, like, final rule was effectively that the group as a whole had to have come to a consensus as to where we were going to go, what we were going to do there, and had begun, generally, as a group, making movement toward achieving that goal. Towards the motor vehicle. Yes. And, you know, we were going to actually, at, when we got to the motor vehicle, that was going to be, we were going to go. You could, you know, because it might have been walking towards the motor vehicle, then doing something else, then going back to the car, and then going. Yep, if, any t if, there, if there was any action to be taken between moving and then getting into the car other than opening and closing trivial doors elevators i don't, I don't think they counted mm. then uh it was all up for grabs again yeah so it was uh we got quite serious about that and then you know we only lost that seriousness as we got more cars and drove less yeah but that is i think shotgun is a time-honored tradition among college kids i think it's a time also the high school kids it's pretty much very important for for people who are putting a lot of people in fewer cars and, you know, people are wanting comfort. Now, equally important among these games, and there are so many different... Now, this one, I actually remember how I learned about it. Oh, I, really? I don't. I was watching a movie, and I don't remember what movie, but I've seen, this isn't a lot of movies. I was a little kid, and it's a bunch of kids, and they're about to go somewhere, and something's going to happen. And then suddenly, one of them goes, one, two, three, not it. And then they all go, not it. And one kid goes, oh, man. Yeah. And I was like, Wow. That's a really elegant way. I didn't think oh, that's a really elegant way. I thought, ha, 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 I was yeah. a kid. Basically, <laughs> when there's something that has to be done by someone. Like uh, doing the Drano. Or taking the trash out or paying the check at the restaurant, right? One person has to accomplish this task. The task must be done by a member of the group right now. But no one wants to do the task. You just go... One, two, three, not it, and you put a finger on your nose. And the last, well, the last person to put a finger on their nose has to do it. I think there are a lot of different variations on the game, but I think the basic game is determining. It's the shortest straw game. and that, Like in Michigan, actually, I, I swear this wasn't racist, but a lot of people would say nigs as opposed to dibs. But I, the etymology of that, and I remember very clearly, because playing Euchre, right? If you screw up the rules in Euchre, like you play, now this is also, you can do this legitimately to cheat. And if no one catches you, then you can win. Mm -hmm. But if you play a card that you weren't allowed to play and you're caught, it's a renege. You know, you've, you've reneged on your deal. Now, just because a lot of people in the Midwest pronounce things horribly wrong, it was renege. Oh man, renege. And because they pronounced it that way, 
renege and nig eventually just meant basically not it or you suck or you screwed up. Ah. So they it basically it was just reverse not it. Mm-hmm. Or reverse dibs, not reverse not it. That's dibs. <laughs> yeah, dibs is the exact opposite of the not it game. It's when everyone wants something, but on, there's only one resource that many people desire. And it's sort of the same game as shotgun, but basically you just say it's usually like a, a, a saving a seat for the future like kind a, of thing. Hey man, I got two pork buns. I got dibs. You know, there are two pork buns, there are six people. You say dibs, now one of the pork buns is yours. Now, I noticed something really interesting about both these games is that we were talking earlier in the show about, like, what a sport tests. It seems like what these games test is who desires the thing the most and who has the presence of mind to get it. But it's not presence of mind as in, like, I say, I got pork buns and suddenly Luke is standing next to me and then suddenly both pork buns are in his mouth. (laughs) 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 But instead, it is, you know, who... Who wants it? If you really want it, then you have the presence of mind. Whoever wanted it the most was thinking, I really want that pork bun enough to think I'm going to say dibs. Yep. Or I'm going to say not it. And I also, there's two ways to play not it. The fundamental ways are either everyone says something and then whoever says it last has to do it. Or there's the surreptitious uh, finger on the nose, which is my favorite way. Yeah, you just put your finger on your nose and you don't say anything. And then, and then eventually, you know, like Scott's got his finger on his nose and Alex's got his finger on his nose and Emily's got her finger on his no- on her nose. And then I'm sitting there and I go, Emily has oh, her I finger in Rim's nose. <laughs> I see it and I go, and I look and I see Pete doesn't have his finger on his nose. Oh, crap. And I put my finger in my nose. And then Pete looks around and goes, ah. And he sees that everyone but him has a finger on the nose. It's another presence of mind thing and I like it. Well, the, you know, these games, in addition to being fun games of winning and losing and also sort of immature, are there's social mechanics that, you know, resolve situations in a way that everyone can agree upon. And generally, it works out because basically the person who wants something the most will usually get it, and the person who doesn't want something the most will usually avoid it. So, you know, out of a group of 10 people, if there's something no one wants to do, but one person really doesn't want to do it, and one person kind of doesn't want to do it, this mechanic arranges it so even though the one person kind of doesn't want to do it, they'll usually end up doing it because everyone wants to do it even less than they do. And, you know, it, it, it kind of works for keeping people happy and together without having a fight. I mean, the, what's the alternative is you sit around and you discuss it for a while because, you know, or everyone's fighting and yelling and hitting at each other. I mean, uh, or the mature solution where you just say, yeah, I'll do it even though I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> mature. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, of course, these games can be distilled to the fundamental thing that is known among a lot of people of just the game. And there's two, you know, that's the game where you're sitting around and suddenly someone says, ah, shit, I lose Mm because they thought of the game. Or I win, which means, oh, they thought of the game and no one else did. They win. Yep. And or uh, there's a lot of like, I remember the game in Michigan that a lot of people play just, you know, that was my childhood. Everything I think Mm -hmm. of from childhood is from the Midwest. It was Padiddle. That's the what? stupidest name for a game ever. What the fuck? It's basically the Cyclops game. If you're in a car and you see another car with only one headlight on, you punch the roof of the car and yell, Padiddle, and basically you win and everyone else loses because they didn't oh, think of it. But what about the game Yellow Car or like Punch Buggy? See, Same game. You see like a Volkswagen, then you hit someone else. Yep. Or uh, actually what we played was Child Molester, and it was if you see a, <laughs> a, if you see a conversion van with no windows in the back. Or one black circular window. Yes, that has no company name and no commercial plates. Ah. And it has to be beat up and it has to be painted brown. <laughs> that just double points. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a scary child molesterish car at the car dealer outside that I saw. It's it's for pretty, sale. Yeah, it's a pretty scary looking car. I don't know who would buy it except a scary person. I think they should just whoever well, looks. Got, like, a kid I think they should just the arrest of a cow catcher. <laughs> no, I'll show you the car. It's really scary. I think whoever buys that car, they should just arrest them. <laughs> Maybe it's a trap. <laughs> Maybe it is, but yeah. I think the, the game that is played the most, the game we're trying to stop playing, because unlike some of the other games, it doesn't serve a great purpose. I think I'm, the, I'm one of the few men in the world who has, who has played the game for as long as I did and transcended it. Yes. And Scott didn't believe me. Mm-hmm. He, tried, he didn't believe that I could do it. I didn't believe I could do it, but I've done it. I, I've mostly kind of gotten rid of it, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but the game is Doorknob. Now, the game of Doorknob does have a purpose, and the purpose is... To prevent the old situation, because pre doorknob, right? What was the situation? It was whoever smelt it, dealt it, whoever made the rhyme, committed the crime, you know, who farted, blah, 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 blah. Doorknob, the game of doorknob, 
sort of encourages a few things. First of all, it in, it slightly encourages not farting at all or holding your farts in until appropriate. <laughs> or, because or or totally farting and then getting away with it and watching your friend Pete get totally wailed on, even though it totally wasn't him. That's, that can also happen. But, you know, it would have been so difficult to create a game that would actually discourage actual farting, you know, among, uh, you know, <laughs> peoples. <laughs> so we made the doorknob game. We didn't make it. It's, it's a game that just sort of came out of nowhere. I mean, and it's not always farting. I've seen kids play it where if someone swears or if someone says just a certain random word or just, yeah, I mean, I've been playing it, it sometime in high school, like the game caught on. I don't know how, and it sort of still is somewhat present a little now, bit. If you don't know the rules of doorknob, it's pretty simple. There is a condition. The condition is always active. If someone meets the condition, anyone who can see them can say the word doorknob. Yep. And that is an indication you have put forth a challenge. <clears throat> Basically, once the doorknob condition has been met and doorknob has been stated, anyone who is within sight at the time has the legal right, as far as I'm concerned, the moral imperative to wail on. Now, wail is the technical term. We'll get to Punch that. Punch them in the arm repeatedly and with... In, to inflict pain. Yes, wailing on is a very specific kid thing that means punching other kids in the arm. Yeah, you can't, you know, punch them in the face. You're you not, can't use you're not the kicking knuckles. them in the beans. You can't, it's just, you're not twisting the nips. It's, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we, maybe we should talk about the, the, the first rule of the front row crew. It's not first, so much a game, though, that fits into the show. But it is the first law. Well, yeah, if anyone has a game that involves titty twisters, you <laughs> are not cool people. No. Well, unless you're into BDSM, then I guess that's okay. I but. guess, yeah, but that's not really a game. That's just sort of a, a, a Well, let me put it this way. The first law ever, ever passed by the front row crew, and it was passed unanimously, was that no member of the front row crew shall ever, under penalty of the same by everyone in the room, commit any act upon another front row crew member's nipple in anger. Yep. <laughs> and he, so basically, if I were to act upon Rim's nipple in anger, and there were ten people in the room, I would uh, receive anger upon my nipples tenfold. It was it was a quite uh, it was you know eye for ten eyes, I guess. Yep. So yeah, no one no one does the titty twisters. Yes. Now second base is totally okay. Second but, base uh, isn't anger. No. Yep. Now if you could somehow commit second base in anger, that's just weird. I guess. Maybe. Yeah. I guess an, uh, an, uh, a non-permitted I could grope. See, I could see an, a friendly like love punch with a, the right situation where you accidentally, but even then, I don't, that's But that's tricky. not in anger. That never happened, luckily. Yeah. But yeah, the, the game of door. Someone says doorknob. You can then, if you, if, let's say rim farts, I say doorknob. That means I can hit rim, right? Now, if rim actually touches a doorknob, not a door handle... Not a door lever. A door knob. If he touches a door knob, now he's safe. I gotta let him go. The way this game usually works is there's a group of kids sitting in like a cabinet band camp. And then, you know, someone rips one. And then everyone just sits there quiet for a second. And then someone, oftentimes it was Nardi when I was in band camp, without even looking up, would just say, door knob. <clears throat> and then you'd, no one ever hit it. No, if door knob was called. I don't think any kid ever would not fess up to it, unless someone else stupidly fessed up to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, pretty much one kid would just, like, look at everyone and then suddenly just start running. See, now this is, how the, this is why the game was so great. It, instead, in the olden days, I remember in, like, elementary, middle school, before doorknob times, it would be, who farted? <laughs> I don't know. We don't know who farted. They're not fessing up, right? But with doorknob, right? If you fart and then say safety, no one can call doorknob on you. So first, it encourages people who fart to say safety and announce that they were the ones who indeed farted, thus preventing them from being doorknobbed. And often it was also, kind of a safety, as in, what are you going to do about it, bitches? That's right. But then again, they just admitted to farting. So you, now you know who farted. And if it smells really bad, you know who to blame. The second part is if they don't say safety because they're trying not to admit it, maybe they know it was really smelly or it was a really terrible one and they don't want it to be known. You get some ruckus. You when get some someone, uh, when, when someone says doorknob, now they'll usually reveal themselves by running for the doorknob. So in the end, you find out who did it, even if no one got beat up. And now, most of the time, the game of doorknob reveals the he who passed gas. So uh, in Van Camp, we... Uh, 
there, I'm, I'm not going to name names here, but there was a person in the senior guy's cabin who was notorious for uh, letting them rip, shall we say. <laughs> and this, 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 this dude, this, uh, this drummer and bass player. He had the, the mighty flatulence. He was proud of it. In fact, in fact, he would, whenever possible, sit in wooden chairs that he could amplify it to the greatest <laughs> possible effect. Was he, like, whittling the chairs to create a sound channel? Well, the best chair to fart in, if you want to make the noise, are the wooden chairs that have, like, the kind of sand Was in he putting the snare drum under the chair for added effects? Uh, he did fart on a snare drum more than once. <laughs> Good God. But, uh... But why didn't he just play the, uh, you know, the, the butterphone in the, in the band there? What? There's, there's no such thing as a butterphone, Yeah, Scott. there is. It sounds like... That's not a buttophone, that's a buttphonium. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Doorknob was the game we played, but th the dude would always sit right next to the door because he premeditated. So one day, he's sitting in the middle of the room, and we're all sitting around, and, and another unnamed person who is, is famous from another story I told about Bandcamp once, about a bathroom and an overflowing toilet, uh. Uh, sneaks over uh, from the outside of the cabin, and he removes the doorknob from the door to the cabin. And uh, one is ripped. Doorknob is called. He saunters over to her with the door, knowing that no one's even going to bother. And then he says, where the fuck did the doorknob go? And <laughs> let me tell you, that was a good day. No, oh, yeah. Because there was no doorknob within like a hundred yards. <laughs> was this a, I imagine this is a large man. He was uh, quite large. <laughs> the, the large men are known for, to, for the flatulence. <laughs> They're also known for not being able to run at all. <laughs> Thus, the game of doorknob has the, the added bonus there. And that the people who are typically more flatulent uh, are typically more threatened by the doorknobbing. So, uh, about six months ago, maybe seven months ago, one day I farted. I ripped one. I was playing some game on the Wii, and Scott says doorknob. And I said, don't you fucking dare. I'm done with that game. Yeah, the, the way the game of doorknob ends is when you basically you fart, you don't say anything. And if someone calls doorknob on you, you basically... Because when you're playing the game of doorknob, it's weird. You don't consciously decide. You just sort of have this rule of society built into you as... Like, you have to actually think outside the box to act outside the rules of the game. and I mean, it's definitely ingrained deep in the yeah, primal I mean, part, parts if, of my when brain. When I was at like, RIT, if someone door called doorknob on me legitimately and they started hitting me, I just couldn't fight back. That wouldn't even come to me. But the way to end the game of doorknob is to say, if you hit me, I'll break your face. <laughs> and thus, nobody will call doorknob on you or try to hit you because, well, you're not going to just cave into the doorknob because you're not playing that game. You'll actually you know, I fight back. I cannot describe to you how difficult it was to not say safety that time I farted. Yeah. Because it was like... You have to, it was, you it have was to like, consciously do it. It's like we're sitting there. We're playing like Icy Hockey or something. And then... <laughs> Icy hockey? Yes. And then Scott looks at me like, you didn't say safety. He just gives me this look. And I'm looking at him right back like, are you going to say it? Because I didn't say it. I'm daring you. And that was the end of that game. Yeah. And so the game mostly ended. Pretty surprised. The result is now people are just letting him rip like all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fantastic, I guess. I don't know. There's something about these games where they're... They're fun, and that's most of what I have to say about them. Yeah. They're kind of like a rite of childhood. They're a rite of passage. Everyone plays them, and every group has their own little, like, idiosyncratic rules about the games or special conditions, and it's just it's great fun there. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, it, it's, I guess, it's something. Is that all we got to say about that? I don't know. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Yeah. Uh, and it's I gotta, Thursday. I kind of had to do some dishes before I cook. Yeah. <laughs> We've been uh, busy lately, shall we say. Busy. Busy. But there's stuff coming. Swag is on the way, and uh, <laughs> it's coming. I gotta tell you, when you guys see the shirt that we're gonna be selling as soon as we get them printed, uh, this shirt is so we should cool. hurry up. Isn't the Katsukon real soon? Yeah, it is. But uh, this shirt is so high quality. I don't think you understand. No, nope, we'll see how many people want it. Hopefully, all of them. The hint is Pockner, and that's all I'm going to say. Great. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. 
Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. All right, so uh, you might notice the show's still going. Emily just reminded us of the one game we forgot, which is the perhaps the game I've played the longest. longest. Jinx. I was playing this in elementary school, <laughs> the game of Jinx, where... If you say the exact same thing at the exact same time as someone else, one of those two people or more multiples of people may call jinx. In and- which time, you cannot say a word until someone says your name. If you don't know how jinx is played, watch, I think it was season one or two of the Simpsons. Hey, let's, let's do an example. Let's both say, uh, you know, hello at the same time, right? One, um, two, two, three. Th- hello. hello. Jinx. 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 Double jinx. I don't know. <laughs> There's different. I forget the exact. Right. Pretty, I think Scott won that one because uh, he said Jinx again before I thought to say it again. Right. So. Right. So because uh, basically now Rim is Jinx. But he's... Scott just said my name, so it doesn't matter. Raw shit. But if I didn't, if I had not have said the word Rim, he would have been jinxed and he would have been unable to say anything at all until I said Rim, and then he would have been able to talk again. Now. Uh... There was an episode of The Simpsons where Lisa has all of her uh, girly friends stay over and do girly things. And among the girly things, they uh, they basically just torment Bart. And they jinx him. And there there is a perhaps the perfect example of how ingrained these games are. Because this interaction has probably happened between many young boys and their fathers in the course of life. Bart is trying to get his dad to say his name. His dad won't say his name. So finally he says, ah, dad, say my name. Why? I'm jinxed. And he just punches him. Bard's dad punches him right then and there. Ah, what'd you do that for? <laughs> Rules the jungle, boy. Yeah, he was he was jinxed and he was talking, so he got hit. That's, <laughs> that's how the game works. <laughs> so yeah, we couldn't let this show go without talking about jinx. Yeah, I can't believe we forgot that one. Uh, if there are any others we have gravely forgotten, or if you have local variations or maybe games that are you know that you play that we didn't mention because we don't know about them. That's what forums are for, people. Yep, but only the always-on games. Don't tell me about Punch for Punch or uh, Bloody Knuckles or Quarters. There's going to be another show about that at some point. Yeah, we're talking about the games that are just sort of always on. You're always playing them. They're you know, not the game that the third graders taught you about when you were in first grade. Exactly. <laughs>